can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Brian Clayton of YourGreenPal.com. And Brian, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. We were just chatting before we hit record here. Um, you know, John Warlow uh, wrote Built to Sell. Uh, great book. You have a great podcast. So check out that episode I did with John. Um, also Michael Gerber of the e -Myth. I know, uh, Brian, that's one of his favorite books, uh, and check out the interview you did with Michael Gerber. It's a classic. Um, and Ross Gordon, um, he talked about how he started craft Jack and how he sold it to home advisor. Um, craft Jack is a similar to your green pal in a lot of ways, but in a different space, uh, for contractors and your green pal is obviously for lawn care. Um, but he talked about how he built up and sold it. And then he runs Mystery Tackle Box. So he's grown it. If you are a bass fisherman um, or you know someone, check that out. Uh, it's a great uh, company that he's built up there. But um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. How do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the accountability, the strategy, and the full execution. Brian, we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company, kind of like you guys, your uh, company does uh, for, for lawn care. Um, and you know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I've found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25.com. And I'm excited to introduce Brian Clayton. He's the CEO of GreenPal, uh, which is an online marketplace to connect homeowners with lawn care services. And often it's referred to as Uber for lawn care. And GreenPal is growing to over 300,000 active customers. And uh, you can check them out at yourgreenpal.com. Previously, he actually built and sold an eight-figure lawn care business himself. So he knows this industry intimately. He's going to share his journey. And it's always a pleasure in talking to someone who's built up a significant company and then uh, they're willing to start over and do it again. Uh, so Brian, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, that was a great introduction. Thank you so much for having me on. I want to talk about early on, because um, early on, your dad kind of pushed you to make money. You want yeah. to make money, but he's like, you know, go make some money. And you got a lawnmower and you started hustling and doing that. Okay. And um, you built that up. And it sounds like you was pretty significant even in high school. Totally. He, he, I think he just got tired of watching me play, play Nintendo all day. And he said, get off your butt. Uh, I, I, I lined up a gig for you. You're going to go mow the neighbor's yard and made me go cut. So the he lined it up for you. Okay. Yeah. Lined it up, negotiated the price and everything. And, and not only that, but after I went over there and, and I thought got the job done, he then walked me around and showed me all the spots I missed. So really helped me get started, giving, giving me that push in the right direction. But something clicked uh, because I got paid 20 bucks for like an hour worth of work. And the first thing I did was pass out a bunch of flyers all over the neighborhood. And, and yeah, I was mowing like 30, 40, 40 yards a week in high school, making 500 bucks a week as a kid. It was awesome. That's and great I just money. Stuck with that, stuck with that business all through high school, all through college, for like 15 years and built it up into an actual business. What did your dad do? My dad was in the military and then, and then he went into manufacturing. So the household was, was, was ran from a top down military style of, of, of management and leadership. So this was not a request. This was a direct order. <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn from your dad in leadership that you brought into? Cause obviously you built up, um, the, uh, your lawn care business to over 150 staff and now you're building up uh, green pal. What did you learn from, uh, about leadership from him? Authenticity, uh, you and 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 you have to lead from the front. You uh, you have to actually do it. You got to really be in there with your people. It's not lonely at the top. You don't know what that means because you're there in the trenches with your people. I learned that from him. 
I, I you know, he 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 raised us that way, and then I kind of also watched him and and his style with how he ran his businesses, and and uh, and so yeah, that that I, that is how I would describe my leadership style to this day. Is I I try not to ask anybody to do anything that I have not done myself, because every time I do that, it always blows up in my face. So that's that was his style, and I hope it's my style today. How big was um. Did you have other high schoolers working for you? What was it like in your senior year? How big was the business then? Yeah, I had maybe two people helping me. And uh, and and I learned a lot of hard lessons around unit economics, around you can't just throw bodies at a problem. You can't just bring on more labor uh, because the business may not sustain that. And there were many weeks where my, my, my helpers got paid more money than I did. So what's awesome about a, a business like that, the lawn mowing business, a home cleaning business, whatever, you can learn the 80%, the 80, 20 of what it means to run a business in such a simple little business like that. And so, and so in those early days, I, I learned some hard lessons around keeping track of labor hours and, and making sure I'm pricing work appropriately and making sure we're running an efficient operation that still, you know, are ingrained in how I look at things today, 20 years later. And then uh, as time went on, I went to college and Went to night school and mowed grass during the day. And I think when I graduated college, I probably had five employees and then made a business plan. And and as time went on, uh, I eventually grew it to 150 people. That's what I was going to ask about the transition from high school to college, because you have a business making money. Some people after college are making the same that you were making your senior year, but you decided to go off to college, but you were still running the business at the same time that you were going to college. Yeah. And it was when it was a hard decision when I graduated because it took Were you time. thinking like I'm not even going to college, I was going to do this full time? Or really that's 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 what my gut was telling me. And looking back, I probably should have just skipped school, but my mom was a professor. She was a PhD English professor. And so I didn't want to let her down. And at the time, I really wasn't totally certain that I was going to be a lawn guy my whole life. You know, I, I, I when I graduated school, I was like, okay, I just I just I have a business degree now. And I'm gonna be a lawn guy. I mean, that that sounds that sounds like that sucks. But but then I I was able to make the distinction like, no, business ownership could be my lane, and and this business is working pretty good. And I was very lucky in the sense that the Middle Tennessee Nashville area was booming then, and is still booming now. And so the the environment around me was growing and prospering. And so there was always new opportunities to grow my little business for new neighborhoods getting built, new apartments, new offices, you name it. And they needed my little, uh, you know, humble services that I was offering. And these were, I guess, uh, more shots on goal for me to test out sales and test out getting new contracts and test out growing my business. Had I not been in such a vibrant community, I don't know if I could have grown that business as fast as I did. So I got very fortunate that I was in that environment. What were some of the growth pains you experienced in, in that business? Yeah, nobody teaches us how to run a small business anywhere. Like it, we're not taught this in high school. Even if you go to business school, you're not taught how to run a profitable business for yourself. You mentioned earlier The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, one of my favorite books that walks you through step by step what it means to work on the business and not necessarily in the business. And, and it took me like five years to like learn that simple thing just through trial and error. And the first maybe five or six years, I was self-employed. I didn't have a business and I had to really make time to work on the business to, to what does this, I have high turnover. I got to get a better employee training system. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm losing more customers than I'm getting. What's going on? I'm, well, I need to get an, a customer satisfaction system in place. Um, what does my sales system look like? I'm just kind of ad hoc making phone calls when I, in my spare time, I need to get like a, like a system in place. And so that took another few years. And then there was like another unlock to the game dovetailing off Michael Gerber's book, uh, you know, working in the business, working on the business. And then the third thing, working on myself. I realized that I didn't have the tool set to to get where I was trying to go. I didn't really, I, I you know, my I, my leadership style wasn't fully baked. Uh, my management was kind of half ass. Um, you know, I didn't really have a formalized kind of like sales uh, strategy, and so I had to grow my skills. Like I had to, I had to work on myself, and and that was hard. That was a, but but it was something that I made time for. 
and maybe year eight or nine, I still try to do to this day. Yeah, Brian, I ask that because, you know, this applies to any business. I don't care if you're a lawn care. I don't care if you're a SaaS business right. agency. You know, the things that you mentioned, and we'll talk about your greenpal.com, but you mentioned employee, you know, the things that were growth pains, employee training you had to solve, um, customer satisfaction system, a sales system, and a leadership, the leadership piece. What did you do from an employee training perspective that worked that that other people should think about? Yeah, and, and this was uh, you had a, over 150 staff, so that's right. Yeah, yeah. and and, and, and a lot and, of people, and, and not like the industry itself is very high turnover, uh, just because it's very labor intensive. We were doing better than the industry averages, but it still is a high turnover business in terms of of staff, and so. That's one of the big bottlenecks and choke points for growing a, a, a services-based business like that is is how do you how do you take a, a you know like McDonald's is McDonald's it can can run off of average uh, people anywhere in the world right their systems are so good and you have to kind of like McDonald's eyes that type of business and so I was looking for ways to do that and I created Lawn Care University and 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 was able to train somebody up in two weeks, what would normally take like nine months and everything from how to properly mow a yard to properly identify plant diseases, a properly identify insect diseases, properly, uh, you know, maintain equipment the right way, how to do it safe and not, not to break windows and throw rocks at cars. All of these like things that you pick up just through like on the job training. I spent a year and just created lawn care university and would put somebody through this. And within two weeks, they were up and going and ready to like be built, be, be able to put into our system. That took a long time. It wasn't fun, but it was the hard work that needed to be done to, to, to solve that piece of the, of, 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 of the bottleneck, I guess you could say. It's like in, in business, there's a difference between hard work and difficult work. The hard work is like beating your head against the wall, training people, and then them leaving, training, and just doing that over and over and over again. The difficult work is investing the time, coming in on a Sunday, making the videos for the training s- uh, series, running it by some of your key people, tweaking it, um, you know, writing the content for the next next module of the training series, You know, experimenting, getting some people to look at that. That's the difficult work. But if you if you do it once, then you don't have to mess with that anymore. And and that was something I wish I had learned way earlier in my journey. Brian, what was the delivery like for that? Um, because you know we're very talking, different. You know we're talking um, someone who's mowing a lawn, right? So, are you giving them a video to watch? Is it a manual? How do you deliver that so that they consume it? Because, like, you know, it's that depends on the 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 people in the niche. Also, it is so painful how much easier it is these days than it was back then. These days, you can spin up a a end-to-end training system uh, for for new employees, new recruits, for whatever the hell it is you're doing in a fraction of the time than than when I was first doing it in 2005. Uh, Because back back then, it was was camcorder in the yard, like takes all day to shoot something that might you might watch for five minutes. And then you get that and you put that on like a quick time thing and, and you, it's in a file somewhere. And, and, then, and then, and then you have a test, but that's on a word document and like literally is very much bean counting and manually and, and manually executing it one phase at a time. And like a, somebody like watching over their shoulder to make sure that they're going through this man nowadays, like there are so many platforms, so many SaaS solutions for this type of thing where you can shoot it on your phone, upload it, you know, in the field, Use Chat GPT to make the copy, and 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 you're often going into test is integrated and all that. There is literally no excuse to not systemize a lot of these aspects of your business these days. That was one of the things that was so painful when I when I sold that company and started a tech business was seeing all of the ways my life was hard and like technology could have made it a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it was still sounds like you were doing it was just harder, but you were doing videos and yeah. Basically training. And, and by yep. the way, I did an interview with uh, very video one based. of the founders of Thinkific. So you could check that one out. And that's what their platform does. There's a lot of platforms out there. But um, actually, we use Thinkific for our, our resources and courses and stuff like that. It's called, so, it's called Think of It? Uh, Thinkific. 
like think, it's ific, think okay. and then i f i c so people can check that out and there's there's a lot out there but i just liked you know he was very his i think his family member maybe his brother was the technical co-founder so very technical but it does everything that needs to probably you wish you would have had that solution in 2005 oh. it's like you pay 50 bucks a month and you can host all your stuff and and everything like that what a time to be alive what a time to start a business it's 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 in many ways it's so much easier than it's ever been but employee training, so I could see that. That's that's really helpful to see. Um, the next piece of a growth pain was customer satisfaction. You had to put in a customer satisfaction system in place. What what did you do as far as that goes that people should think about? Yeah, well, it, it's 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 going to sound trite, but it literally <laughs> just asking people how we're doing. Like, how are what are three things you wish we would do better, and 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 how are th- what are three things we can do to make your life a little easier. Like we would literally email our top 300 customers that on a weekly basis. And, and that was something that I deferred for like five years because I thought that our customers were insatiable, unreasonable, uh, looking to get one over on us. Uh, You know, we were at odds with our customers a lot of times. And that was a a totally wrong attitude to have. And that was the, the source of a lot of kind of my misery at times running that business. And, uh, and when I, when I changed that, that, that mindset to like, let's just ask our customers how we're doing. And then let's ask, act on that. That's the first step. And then you can fix a lot of the problems that you kind of knew about, uh, but maybe you were deferring them or maybe you were sweeping them under the rug. And, and so that's step one. And then step two, putting in a system to, to uh, make sure you reinforce that little thing, but then also, do business with yourself. Secret shop yourself. I started doing that, uh, and I still do it to this day with Green Pal. I would, uh, you know, like I would have my my fiance at the time uh, call in to the front office and just 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 ask for an estimate and and ask for you know go through the whole sales process, you know, and, and I would just kind of watch it. And I and and I came to learn that we were actually quite rude to to people that wanted to do business with us. I didn't know this. But it wasn't until I like signed up for my own business and did business with myself that I come to realize this. And uh, so there's this weird like gap that forms in every business between founder logic and customer logic. And the founder is like looking at the, all everything from one paradigm, and the and the customer is looking at it from a whole nother perception, a whole nother paradigm. And and like there's this weird gap. And 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 yeah, I think the only way to close that gap is to do business with yourself. And and ask your customers how you're doing. And then the third thing is do your own customer support uh, at least an hour a day. Um, if you if you do that, you'll never be at a loss for what are the top three things you should be working on as a founder. And and so even to this day with with GreenPow, you know, I still try to do at least an hour a day, sometimes more of, of phone support, chat support, email tickets, you name it, because I don't I don't want this gap to develop between my thinking and customer thinking. You know, you mentioned this and like a lot of people swear by, you know, the MPS, you know, sending that out uh, that helps. or to their, to their clients, customers. There's two things that stick out when you talk about this. One is um, how did, you know, you were asking the top 300 customers, what can we do better? What was the best, best methods to get a response back? Because, you know, they're busy people, right? Um, how did you make sure it was you know, um, I don't know, engaging or uh, there's there's something in it for them or would they just respond? I don't know. In, in, in those days, it was just a straight up old fashioned handwritten email. But these days we, we integrate these things into our live chat. Uh, if somebody is talking to us uh, through through live chat on our app uh, and then and then that also integrates and connects to, to email. I think live chat and email are probably the best ways to ask. Um, you mentioned earlier, like NPS, and that's a good way to kind of get a finger like on the pulse of, of what's going on. But, but the NPS is, is, is an output metric of like what's happening. I think you like, you really need to like, what are the input metrics? What are the things that I'm doing to improve the customer experience? And let, let's, let's focus on those. Yeah. An NPS survey is good. It kind of like tells us how good or bad things are, but, but what are the actual like habits, the things we're doing every day, that that help us get there and and for me like like the a daily habit is running customer support personally every day 
for at least an hour. That really helps me. Like, and, and you talk about leadership style. My people see that, and 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 so when we're when we're sitting around in a, in a meeting discussing something, it's like I was like, I can say, no, actually, I talked to four people last week that had this problem, and so I, you know, I this is baked in actual interaction with the customer. It can be helpful for for a founder to do that tactically and and also from a leadership perspective. What was something that came out of that was surprising when you asked those three hundred customers, um, "How can we do better?" What surprised you? You know, I thought then and when I was starting GreenPal that all they cared about was price. All they cared about was like I thought I, I didn't really want to ask the question because I thought they they would say. Um, I I really wish you would like cut your prices, or I really wish you would like charge us five percent less, or or something like that. But but no, it it wasn't that. It 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 was more around reliability. Like you mm. guys can't you come out on Monday one week and then you come out on Wednesday another. And I know like rain's a factor and stuff, but you don't communicate these things to me. I don't know. Um, and so like I kind of knew that was a problem, but I didn't really want to address it. And so I had to build a system back then where it's like, okay, it, it, it rained on Monday. We need to communicate to everybody that was going to get service on Monday that we're going to be there on Tuesday and so on and like build a process and a routine to fix that. And because, and then and then guess what? I didn't hear that anymore. And now it was three more things. And then so you just go through those cycles of, of, uh, of, of iterating through improving your business based on what customers are telling you. Not what your ideas or assumptions are. Yeah. And you've baked in, what's interesting, Brian, you've baked some of these things into GreenPal, right? So like reliability, I'll have you talk about it, but like these pain points that you were experiencing in this surveying customers is also embedded into GreenPal. So talk about how, when, from a customer user experience, what's, how is it baked into GreenPal? And we can start with reliability. Yeah, it, it's like when I started GreenPal, in many ways, I was solving a lot of my own problems. I was solving things that I saw exist in, in the real world but between buyers and sellers in this business. And so I, I knew that that was, going, that was going to be an issue. I knew that the, the case of the disappearing lawn guy was real because I, I was kind of that, that guy you know, for, uh, at, at certain points. And so I knew that we needed to solve for that. And the way I, I felt like we should solve for it is we should just hold vendors accountable for how reliable they are. If they're supposed to be there on Thursday, let's score that. And we can now, because we have technology and we've built this platform, we can score how reliable they are and how often do they show up on the days that they're supposed to. And then we can surface that to consumers and let them make a better informed buying decision. Some consumers don't care about reliability. Maybe it, maybe it's just an empty lot or a rental house, just mow it once a month, I don't care. But if you, if you want your, your lawn mowed on Friday, that's important. And and we need to score that. And and that's been a, a critical thing that's separated GreenPal from like the status quo is you can jump on GreenPal and quickly look at, okay, these service providers are are scored on how reliable they are and how serious they're taking running this running their business. What else is embedded into a GreenPal that again, reliability is one. I'm gonna um you know, actually, Brian, just share my screen for a second and just so people can see. So if you're watching, if you're listening, um, there's a video of this on YouTube. Um, so you can see, right, yourgreenpal.com. You can see, again, it's just some of the things to think about from a website perspective. I'm sure uh, Brian has tested this a million times of how this is laid out, what customers are looking for. But one of the things that sticks out um, to me, you know, this following this, I look, love looking at websites and kind of the the user experience, because this is what they spent a long time testing. You can see it's got a lot of the social proof stuff here. It's got uh, pricing, because people are probably asking about that. And then look, it says, tired of unreliable local lawn care. I mean, hitting the pain points in the in the subject. One thing I wanted to point out is, you know, you were talking about the reliability, and I just, you know, you have a bunch of resources here of different cities, all popular locations. Obviously, I'm outside of Chicago. So I'm looking at this, but you can see right, um, you know, this is also a social proof reliability piece. Um, it has higher, how many times a person has been hired? So hired. So that you put in here who, uh, because of that. Yeah, we, because we're in the middle of the transaction, 
we can show you what's going on and we can show you, okay, this is the spot price for your lawn and your zip code for contractors that want to do that surface. And here are, are your different options in terms of what other people are saying about them, how reliable they are and how often they show up on the day they're supposed to. And then also, once you get to the menu of hiring somebody, you see another third metric of how often do they get booked for an ongoing service? How often do they get booked for you know a second, third, or fourth visit? Because for us, that's a key uh, that's a key metric to indicate are they any good or not. You know, do you really want to work with somebody that that only gets booked for a second or third visit ten percent of the time? You want to work with the guy or gal that's getting booked all the time. And so that that's uh, something that we bring to the marketplace because we're in the middle of the transaction. We we measure these things versus if you're hiring somebody on Facebook Marketplace or 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 home advisor or or Angie's list, they don't really know that stuff because they're not facilitating the transaction. Yep. So you could see so those are some things you think about reliability. What else did you, from feedback wise, did you include in GreenPal? Because again, you're listening to the customers and it's a dual sided marketplace too. What else did you include because of feedback? Yeah, it, it it was like when I started GreenPal, so I built and sold my landscaping company and and I felt thought, man, you know, I I I think I know everything there is to know about getting a business going. And then I started GreenPal and I'm like inventing a whole new product from scratch. And I realized you don't know the first thing about this. Is it was it was literally like starting all over again. I was, even though I was a second time founder, I was a first time founder all over again. So I had to learn all of these lessons all over again by talking to vendors that use the platform and also customers that used it. And in the early days, it was 20, 30, 40 people. And I, you know, sitting at kitchen, kitchen tables, you know, inside of a Starbucks, you name it, any, anywhere where somebody would meet with me that tried it, it would tell me, okay, you know, I, I hired this person to, to come out and mow and they didn't have the right size lawnmower for the fence gate to get into the backyard. So they, they weren't able to do it. I was like, okay, we got to, let's take a note of that. That's one problem we got to solve. Or I hired this, this guy and he actually mowed a little, little too low. And I like it uh, to be uh, four inches rather than not two. I was like, okay, we got, <laughs> we got to build in a little thing for that. And it was like, it was going over and over. People and over are very and over. particular about their lawn sometimes. Exactly. Some people don't care at all, but some people are very particular. So it's not like a commodity. So it was going through those interviews over and over and over again and, and seeing like, all the thousand things that can go wrong between your grass is two feet tall and just trying to get somebody to come mow it for you, we now had to solve as a platform. And the only way we know what to focus on is by talking to customers and and letting them guide us and almost be like free R&D for what we needed to focus our firepower on. Because we had very limited firepower. We've been self-funded the whole way and we kind of had to make smart bets with what little bit of money we had. We'll get into growing the user base. A dual-sided marketplace is no joke to uh, build because you're building two two different sides. But I want to get it back into, you know, you mentioned employee training systems, customer satisfaction systems, sales systems. At one point in the organization, you realized you had the operational pieces down and you realized I'm a sale, now I'm a sales organization. Ooh, that was a tough tough growth hurdle in my first business and my second business. So in my, in my first business, it was year five or six. And I had to, I, I, I had to had this epiphany. It's like, I'm not in the landscaping business. I'm in the sales business. I, I, I like, if I can't get a sales process, a sales system, a sales machine at the core of this thing, then I don't have a business. I'm not going to get to 3 million. I'm just, I'm going to be stuck at a million and a half, 2 million for my whole life. And, and I'm literally going to be self-employed for the rest of my life. I'm never going to build a business if I can't figure that out. And so I took like three years, like, like running a sales system myself and doing it very poorly and ineffectively and with very little success, but just making it better and better and better and better. And then eventually getting a process that I could train somebody else on. I made a bad mistake in that first company of thinking that there was something mysterious about our industry and trying to hire salespeople that knew the industry and not necessarily motivated sales oriented people. And I had to like undo all of that wiring and say, no, our, our industry is not that complicated. I actually, I just need to hire a motivated sales type of person and teach them my system. And once I started doing that, I was able to, to build a repeatable sales engine. 
and which eventually was was about five or six people that that reported to me and and I was kind of the sales manager in in my part time and in fast forward to green pal I, I I took that approach again very hand to hand combat very very us uh, uh white glove in terms of getting people on the platform because that's what was needed to get the first 100 500 customers then as time went on I, I started to realize well that playbook won't work for this because I can't one at a time sell people onto the platform I need a million customers to make this thing matter and and I started to ask them you know how do you normally find a lawn care service and they and they would always like say well after I've tried everything else I'll just go to Google and type lawn mowing near me and I'll just dial for dollars on on the on the search engine results page and so we started like hearing hearing that more and more and then and we realized okay our sales engine now is actually competing in this channel we need to compete in in google organic search and then we realized however hard it was to build this platform it's going to be twice as hard to make that happen we have to like orient the whole company around competing in this channel and and we made that bet early on in like year two and it, it you know we're a decade in and that's still how we get 50% of the people that, that try our product out is through a simple Google search. That's a tough route to take. I know you've tried different things, right? Um, because SEO is a long-term strategy. It's an ongoing long-term strategy. And you've talked about in the past, it's like, I love the analogy you use. It's like getting in shape. You know yeah. what I mean? Like you can't just stop, you know, even if you're in shape. You yeah. stop eating right, you stop working out, you're going to go back to where you were. So right. it's really a tough one. What's worked with SEO? Why it, it SEO? I mean, it's it's like, uh, it's a tough decision to make, I think. It, it goes back to a lot of, uh, well, it's got to it's, it's gotta be a core competency, I think, in order to compete in it. You can't do it. You can't sprinkle on some SEO at the end. Um, it has to be almost like core to what your company does. Um, and you start to look at a lot of these really successful uh, platforms, they, they start to look a lot like publishers almost. Like, uh, you know, big companies that, that, are, that are doing very well put out more content than a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of news agencies. It's really, really strange. But they're getting a lot of traffic to their property, and 1% and of that traffic is turning into people that need their services. And, and so, uh, so playing that game is hard. And, and I think a lot of it in the early days does come down to good daily habits uh, and and uh, a lot like dieting almost and, and a lot and a, and a lot of like faith and working a plan because with SEO and getting in shape you don't see results for a very long time and you have to you have to stick it out you have to work work it day in and day out and uh, keep the momentum you know and and, uh, and you know you go to the gym one time you get home I, you look exactly the same SEO you write 10 blog posts, your traffic looks exactly the same. But if you keep working the process, the, the inputs over a year, you know, you'll wake up in a very different reality where it's like now, okay, I've got, I've got 20,000 visitors to my, to my website every month. I didn't have to pay for every one of those to come to my, 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 my property. And what uh, that's found what... works with this. So I'm, I'm looking, if you're looking at the video, you can see your greenpale.com. You can go to the blog. This is, you know, these are funny pictures. Obviously, can mowing over dog poop be dangerous? It's worse than you imagined. <laughs> what are things that you do that's working from a content perspective for SEO? A couple of things. Um, this is one, hard. one is um, when it comes to blog posts and content, we really try to write content that solves people's problems, that it answers a question that they're actually asking. And the way we do that is, um, through through Reddit, Quora, Facebook groups. Um, if if they're asking a question around, like, hey, I have a customer that that has a Great Dane that has dog poop all over the place, and I'm mowing this. Is this bad for my health? Like th that was a question somebody asked, and we, and so we researched it and we wrote a piece about that. And and so we might get you know I don't know a hundred visitors a, a week off that piece, and maybe one or two of them will sign up. And and so. Focusing on answering questions that people are actually asking and and creating the content um, that solves a problem for them, that helps them figure out how to do something has been helpful for us. And we don't really do a whole lot of keyword research or anything like that. We just run this, this cycle of, okay, people are asking these 10 questions. Let's, let's write content for that. The, the second thing is um, 
the exhaust from our platform, uh, the natural kind of output of lawns getting mowed. How do we use that to create content? And and so okay, well now we know the average price. We know the we know the average uh, we know the average like service cadence. We know how often people are are adding on shrubs, uh, shrub pruning. We know how often people are seeding and fertilizing, and packaging that up and putting that into the vendor's kind of profile has really helped us create unique content at scale. Um, for these individual service providers so they can rank for uh, lawn care uh, Chambly or 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 lawn care uh, uh, Peoria, Illinois, or something like that. Um, the, these these long tail kind of uh, service plus local city keywords. And so we do we do a lot of a lot of content handcrafted and then a lot of content programmatically and and that that hybrid has helped us. Love it. No, I love that the way you do customer research on some of those platforms, right? And just taking the questions and answering them because anyone could go on Reddit and core in their specific industry and take a look and see what actually people are saying or Facebook groups or Amazon. Some people look at Amazon reviews on products or books exactly. or things like that. Exactly. And, 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 and the content there is not going to be premium. It's going to be a bunch of people shooting from the hip, answering it ad hoc. And so you have to like pick out the, the nuggets and use that as the basis for, for your research and then like bring it all together and package it up into one piece. That's a lot more helpful for people. And, you know, Brian, going back to the sales process for a second for, you know, um, your green pal, obviously SEO is helping with getting people there. When you had your the lawn care business and you grew it, um, what was what did the sales process look like when you had just toiled for three or four years? Um, what kind of walk me through that? Yeah, we eventually learned that we were never going to build a, a profitable business competing on price, and and so a lot of people in that industry is super hyper competitive, low barriers to entry. And so, and so competing on prices is, is common, whether people want to admit it or not. We had to shift the whole thing and try to figure out where are our customers trying to, to go? Where, what are they trying to achieve? If you're McDonald's, you're trying to increase sales, you know, uh, uh, same store sales, and you're trying to figure out how to get people to buy more extra value meals. And so we would look at that as like, well, how do we, how do we get people to buy more extra value meals? Okay, well, I got to tell you, the drive-through looks horrible. It's full of cigarette butts. It's full of bubble gum wrappers. Like, I don't want to eat here. Like, this looks so awful. And we would take pictures of that. It was like, and, and we would say, hey, here's a before of what your drive-through looks like. And and we cleaned it all up. Our, our technicians cleaned it all up uh, as, as part of our, our weekly mowing. And now here's what it looks like. And we just think that that might help you increase apple pie sales or something like that. And we would tie what we're doing, not to the, not just cutting the grass to how do we help you get where you're trying to go? We would do that for restaurants or, or for apartment complexes. They would say, uh, we would ask them like, okay, yeah, well, well, what is your, what is your occupancy? You know, what's your vacancy? He's like, well, we're at 89%. Really? Okay. Well, you know, we went to the greater Nashville uh, apartment association meeting last week and they were saying that uh, average uh, and this market is 95%. Well, why don't you think you're there? Well, you know, this, this, and this. And, and we said, well, what if, what if we can help you move that a couple of points? I think we can help you get to 91 or 92 over the next year. And if we don't, then you don't have to renew the contract. Uh, and we're going to get you there by making the grass a little greener and thicker. We're going to install some flowers around the, the, the model. We're going to install a, a seasonal color display around the entrance to lure people in. And, uh, and, and when we were able to deliver on that, man, that's a customer for life. They're not bidding you out every year. And so taking that long view with our with our clients and help them get where they were trying to go in business. And we weren't just grass cutting. We were trying to help them get where they were trying to go with their objectives is what shifted it. And that was kind of an unlock. And nobody else was doing that. I love it. Right. And so, you know, so basically everyone could be asked their the question of their company, how can our company solve a bigger challenge for that person? And and you were talking about you know, not a, not comparing the features, but talking about the benefits, right? Like you weren't going in there with lawn care. Like how can we solve their occupancy and what are the things our company can do? Because who would think a lawn care company is going to solve my occupancy, my vacancy, right? And, but you 
showed them ways that they could actually help with that. Um, so that's that's great exercise to think through. The last question is, um, uh, Brian, first of all, I want to thank you. I want to point people, they could check out yourgreenpal.com. So if you are a homeowner or you own a apartment complex or something like that, you can actually get some quotes in your local area because they're all over the, the US. Um, so yourgreenpal.com. My last question is on leadership. Um, you mentioned that was kind of like the last piece of improving yourself. So what are some you know, mentors, it could be your mentors in business or distant mentors, meaning books or resources you like. We mentioned the E-Myth. Um, and what are some of your um, go-to uh, leadership resources? Yeah, every book John Maxwell has ever written, obviously. I mean, that that, and that's really all you have to do uh, if you're trying to be a, a, a good leader in a small business. You don't need to read much else other than his stuff. It, and, I, and I stumbled onto John's stuff one day I was driving into my office, uh, running my first company and I had like this, this pit in my stomach. Like I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to like, I didn't, I didn't want to go. And, and I, and I was like, man, I mean, half the people that work for me are jerks. My customers are always complaining. Uh, what, why does it suck so bad? And I, I hate this. What, ha I felt like a victim and I thought, and then some, and like a voice in my head said, you idiot, you built this. This is a reflection of you. This is a reflection of your enthusiasm. This is a reflection of, of your level of intensity you're bringing to this business. You don't have the fire in your belly anymore like you used to. And that's why all of this has decayed around you. And so I think it's important to like, when, when you're in business, everything is your fault. And and it all is scaffolding around you, the your people, your team. You get exactly the culture you deserve as the founder. John's stuff really helps you uh, face that reality, and then and then also reminds you that it's all about servitude. You really have to care. There's no way to fake it. You got to care. And I don't know any know any any other shortcut. You have to give a crap about your people. Brian, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone, check out uh, yourgreenpal.com. Check out more episodes of the podcast. And thanks. Thanks, Brian. Jeremy, I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.